All right, so uh, right for this, we had at our place 6.39 inches rain on that last batch over whatever that was, a week or something like that. Well, you're not living good, are you? No, I'm just totally teasing, totally teasing. We, we missed it. I, I live, from where I live, you can see 10 miles away is where Tabrock Lake runs, 10 miles. We're out on Big Ridge, so in the morning, I can see the fog line. There will be a fog line as that cold air is there in the morning. I can see exactly the outline of Tabe Rock Lake, Taney Como Tabe Rock Lake. I can see it exactly. And many, t so I know where it is. I know the ridges, you know, kind of what it looks like, been living there 20 plus years. And all the time I see rain go down Tabe Rock, sitting there in the dry. It's a, it makes me so mad. Uh, so right before that rain come in, I, you know, I don't believe weather people anymore. I mean, I just, they're, they're as bad as the Cardinals are this year. I don't believe them at all. So I saw rain coming in. I mean, in the headlights, I was out, spreading food plot seed in the headlights because rain is rain is gold folks in the Ozarks our soils don't hold moisture well it's really rocky it rains China talks about getting more water because it's going through that quick uh, and there's some rag that's ragweed you see ragweed sticking up I, no big deal I just weed eat it in there and then the next day or two Evan come through and weed eat it down that I, I've spread seed and Evan come in and uh, we needed that down. You cut ragweed this time of year pretty close to the ground, you probably killed it. And if it does sprout back, man, that's just more food in my food plot. That's just more food. I know you're thinking, deer eat ragweed? Yeah, they eat a lot of ragweed. They love ragweed. Uh, so anyway, I just walked through. I got a little over the shoulder spreader there. Uh, I always plant blends. If you don't believe in blends, this summer should have really convinced you because the Milo at our place is carrying the load right now. You know, deer have ate a lot of stuff out. We're delaying planting because it's dry. But I just literally out there spreading right on top of it, knowing I had some rain coming, that raindrops fall at about 30 miles an hour, give or take. So they're going to help that seed get to the soil. If I, I'm sure some seed stuck on top of this ragweed, but you get six inches rain, it's going to the ground. And it's already germinated. There's already little, you know, I don't know, quarter inch, half inch fuzz all through that place. So. Look forward to that. Why did I seed this place in particular? I mean, man, I really want this. Well, let's just, I call it, that's how much rain we got. I call this a little hidey hole food plot. Hidey hole food plot may be size of this room. I like to stuck them in the timber, stick them in the timber, or maybe a power line where I have to kill trees or an old pond or something like that. Because this, you can see this is my place last year, uh, December 12th. And the magic here is, if you have pretty good quality habitat, we burn a lot, we kill a bunch of trees, we kill cedars like crazy. Uh, I mean, like hundreds of acres of cedars. Well, I've sold a bunch of land, but we have killed hundreds of acres of cedars. You may say, well, cedar's good cover. I saw that old buck run into cedar. That's just like, if I hadn't eaten in five days, I might eat a snail, but normally I'm not eating escargot, all right? Deer use cedars because it's the best cover around, not because it's good cover. And you say, well, they need winter cover. We not in Canada. And if you go deer hunting, I challenge you on a real cold day, go sit under the shade of a cedar tree. It won't be long you're scooting out there to the sunshine. Deer want to be in that tall, warm native grass in the winter so the wind is not getting to them laying down on the ground, but the solar heat, it's just like us being in a car on a real cold day and the windows are up, gets nice and warm, take a nap in there midday while you're hunting. A deer will bed, you know, within about eight inches of the ground when they're laying down eight, nine inches in the size of deer. The wind can't get there in thick native grass, but the sun's energy gets there, and man, they're, they're just chilling out. They're just taking it easy. They're not chilling, they're warming up. So this whole hidey old food plot, we have good habitat. So our female fawns will reach, you know, 65, 70 pounds by that time of year. And when you do that, that's puberty for a female fawn, and they become receptive. That's right. You hear all stuff about first rush, second rush, third rush. That's all nonsense. But if you have a big batch of female fawns coming in that are healthy, you're getting another spike in rut behavior because another prom's coming around, right? We went from football to basketball prom. They're coming back around. Yeah. So just watch this. Just several minutes here. So a female fawn, obviously a female fawn. This is the same place I just seeded. You know, in order summer, some rag we grew up, that's, this is the same place. It's on an old little cut through road, timber on both sides. All those cedars you see behind there have now been cut. That wood's way open, sun can get down. I just walked through the other day and there's food all in there. We killed every cedar in there and then we burned it. 
So got a few bucks there because that time of year, not many does are receptive. By the way, we got a stand about right where I'm standing over here. We got a tree stand right on this side. I wasn't in it that day. Uh-oh, here's another. Because remember, there's a lot of bucks still thinking, dang, that prom was fun. I want to go back to it, but not many dates. Female fawns are one of, when they're receptive, one of the best times to hunt in the Ozarks if you have good quality habitat. And I hunt public land, but grew up hunting public land. If you're hunting mill Mark Twain and the only tree's down, if the lightning struck it and there's nothing to eat, this isn't going to happen because those deer are starving. This is not going to happen. Got some habitat to make this happen. But now, hey, it's still going. There's that female fawn going, are y'all paying attention to me? The boys are dumb. Yeah. What's some other stuff you can learn here? See how this buck walking in is barely got any stain on his tarsal gland? And that bigger buck's a lot more stained, and the medium buck's kind of medium stained. More mature deer, that scent on the tarsal gland is kind of their calling card or their advertisement. And, you know, if we's in a room of a Navy SEAL reception, I don't think any of us be acting macho right now, right? We'd probably be like, can I get you, you know, some water, sir? You want my pizza? Uh, deer will literally bend over and lick that scent off. Bucks will, if they're young or immature bucks, depending on where they're living, maybe they're the biggest buck in the world because everyone shot all the bucks last year, uh, so they don't draw attention to themselves. Some of the lodges I used to work down in Texas, uh, maybe they killed, you know, a, a big mature buck, great big bases or thing, not much for tines. And they're cut off, have taxonomers cut off from out here down because that buck will be stained all the way down to the hooves. They killed the most dominant buck on the property, no matter what the antlers say. So if you're out there hunting and you shoot, don't shoot, but well, one hint, just one indicator you can have is what's the stain look like on tarsal glands? And you can tell when they lick it off because it'd be a flat line on the bottom, just like that tongue going across there. It won't be dripping down the leg. Anyway, just a little hint there, a little side. So these little hidey old food plots, we harvest, I've never done the math, but I'll bet we harvest at least 50% or more of our bucks off hidey hoes. They're not for a feeding deer. The size of this room is not providing enough groceries to make a difference in the deer herd's nutrition. So deer consume about 5% of their body weight a day. Dry weight, all the moisture taking out. 100 pound dough, 100 pound buck, five pounds a day. Vegetation, which is growing, you know, if it's moist, not in a drought, growing, that it takes about 17 pounds wet weight, and they're gonna salivate and urinate and respirate. We lose a lot of moisture respirating that moisture out, so that doesn't count. That's no goody to them. The dry weight, like you put it in an oven, bake it, bake it, get all the moisture out, takes about 17 pounds on average, give or take, moisture and all that stuff, uh, to make five pounds of dry weight. Well, you got four old nannies coming into, you know, a place the size of this room and your vegetation's only this tall, you know, every, you don't have four foot tall vegetation, you don't have that many pounds out there. So they can literally keep it what I call lip high. You know, their lips just can't get any closer to the ground to eat anymore, that's lip high. Uh, so these are attractions. These are not, don't, you know, don't buy a quarter acre bag of seeds. Say, well, I'm going to have some big antlers next year. That's not going to happen, right? That's, that's just not how she works. But, you know, you know, a weed eater, you may not have a tractor. You can take a weed eater. Got some old nasty Ceresa in here. This is Ceresa, Ceresa Lespediza. Noxious, noxious weed all through the Ozarks. It was from China. We brought it over here. The government did years ago thinking it was smart. It spread everywhere. Billions of dollars spent. It, folks, it never works to move stuff. I mean, there's a couple of species. No one's mad that there's pheasants, right? Pheasants are from the Mideast. They're not from here. They're not native here. But you think about all their stuff. Sparrows, uh, the, the, the blight that killed all the chinkapins, the chestnuts. Uh, you think of all the things. You, you should not move species. No one should be moving deer anywhere. No one. And by the way, it's not nutrition or ge it's gene not genetics. Y'all just know. Um, Everyone's from Missouri, right? Home crown, home crown town here, right? So if you go down here right south of Branson, uh, Drury Mincy public land. Well, I killed a bunch of, killed the first year I ever killed the bow on that public land. Or Caney Mountain, or Peck Ranch. All Ozark hillbilly deer, not great big, right? Peck Ranch is a little bigger now because they've been killing a lot of trees, doing a lot of fire. Put those in northern Missouri when they were restocking our state. The restocking records are clear. Now you grow world record deer in northern Missouri. Why is that? 
Same, same genetics, exact same genetics as Taney County. It's groceries. Another more recent study, I'm off subject, y'all okay with this or, yeah. Mississippi State just did some great work. Uh, they took deer, just finished this work not that long ago, been going for a decade, off a of barrier island in Mississippi. Starvation alley for deer, sand pit out in the ocean, in the ocean, okay, sand pit. Big buck weighed about 100 pounds. Brought some bucks and does up to university, put them in a pen, and then took deer from the delta, the Mississippi River bottom, soybeans, corn, some of the best dirt on the planet, like the Nile River bottom, grow 200 inch deer, I mean, just awesome, okay? Brought them up there and kept them three generations. A generation is about three years, you know, fawns born, may, bred, may breed, may not, year and a half, still not a good mother, two and a half years old, that's three years, right? Has a fawn, pretty good mother at two and a half. So three generations of that. At three generations, you know, these pens are side by side. They don't let them interbreed. They're two pens, side by side, same food, you know, everything, same graduate students, everything's the same. Can't tell the difference after three generations. It's not genetics, folks. Never genetics, it's always food. I, love, I work properties all the time. Man, we got, we got really good genetics here. Or, you know, it's closed campy for us, cedars everywhere, no groceries. But our genetics are horrible here. We need to import some deer. I said, no, you need a chainsaw. <laughs> so, and then we use fire. You don't have to use all this herbs. I'm not anti-herbicide. It's just grossly overused. Like, I don't love my dentist. Maybe you love your dentist. I don't love my dentist. I don't want a root canal. But if I need one so I don't rot out the rest of my teeth, I'll get one. That's kind of how I look at herbicide. You got a noxious weed you can't kill. But uh, we just, you know, weed eat real close to the ground or rocks, still the rocks in there. Yeah, you see all the rocks, that's our soil. We weed eat a path, take a backpack, blow a rake, blow it out, wait till it gets dry, drop a match, let one hatch. Uh, just burn that duff off. Cerisa will come back. Fire usually won't kill it, but it won't come back that strong during your fall. You're making little hidey holes for fall honey. This is not a springtime plot usually. So we just burn it off, and you're also taking all the nutrients out of this and making it fertilizer. Now the nitrogen is volatilizing, it's going up. It's super, super unstable. Don't worry about that, folks. Over every acre on the planet is 30 plus tons of nitrogen. We're breathing nitrogen all the time. Paying for nitrogen is silliness. You just need to plant some legumes. Those are plants that take nitrogen out there and put it in soil. We didn't even have any nitrogen in America for ag until after World War II. And one of the scientists that was working on the atom bomb for Hitler escaped to America, and he, fortunately he didn't make it or we'd be speaking a different language right now. But as his process trying to figure out how to make an atom bomb, he figured out how to make nitrogen relatively inexpensively. That's how we got nitrogen fertilizer. Or the Great Prairie, you know, western Missouri all the way to eastern Colorado, scientists believe had about 60 million bison. Bison's twice as big as a cow, so about 120 million cattle. Not that many cattle there now, fortunately. Uh, no one was adding nitrogen. No one's adding any phosphorus. No one had any lime. Even our Ozark soils will do it. I haven't paid for any fertilizer. Except little test plots, little strips, little test plots, something, in eight years. If you watch our show, we're going pretty good deer. So anyway, we burn this off. It'll crackle, that's some moisture popping out of the plant, you know, getting hot, busting out of the plant cell. If you know, do a lot of fires, watch it close. It's just easing through here. It's not like California, you know, taking my neighbor's house down. It's just easing through here. There's so much green vegetation, it's just really slowing it down. A lot of times it won't carry. And if it won't, you've been getting a lot of rain, cerisa, weeds, ragweed, whatever's real green, take your weed whacker, eat it off to the ground, let it dry for three or four days, and then drop a match on it. And then right before rain comes, uh, I, we call, we have interns and employees and whatnot, uh, they rarely have a weight program. We call that the Grant Woods Weight Loss Program. It really just means work. Folks, you know, in America we're supposed to work. I, you know, I don't know, we lost that somehow, but yeah. So you see a little sweat coming off Drew there. We're working, we're hustling. I'm, I'm there too. I'm just, you know, Drew's better looking than me. I'm, I'm wet too. We're hustling, and you can see, one thing about burning, you can see your seed real easy. You can tell if you're getting good seed placement. That's just a little side tip, right? You, you learn these things by doing it. Got a little over-the-shoulder spreader. 
And if you're pointed up, like I'm probably telling him off camera, point up, if you're pointed up, you get a bigger arc. You get better distribution. But what we like to do is someone plant this away and someone plant that way. And that way you know you get good coverage. If you don't get coverage, folks, something's going to grow. So you're going to have weeds. Where you don't get this, you're going to get weeds. And it's really easy to put too much seed out and you get halfway through the plot and you know you knew you was going to plant a bag of seed or whatever and you, you don't get it out. So we plant real light, may walk it two or three times. That's so much better than, well, doggone it, I only bought three bags of seed and I put it all on half a plot or something like that. So open that gate. There's a little gate. You see his thumb right here. There's a little gate right here. And you're just controlling how open that, I call it a gate, gauge, whatever it is. And that's a little slit in there. And the more you open that up, the more seed falls through. And then I've learned, just pull that strap around your shoulder where it tilts up just a little bit. And if it tilts up, you get a little wider arc. You don't want to go in straight up. But if you're pointing down, you're not getting near the coverage. So anyway, just little practical hints. And it's a hide hill. This is just the other day here at our, at our place, just down the road. It's in the shade. This is a pond. It's never held water since I've owned the property. We got, you know, six inches rain last week, or it was, and I don't believe there was any water in the bottom. I don't Danny might be. If it is, it'd be like, you know, size of that target, that Morel target or something. It won't, it won't hold water. Um, you Ozarkers, why do we always build ponds on ridge tops? Anyone know? Because that's where clay is. Clay holds water. And the bottom is so eroded, there's rarely any clay. When you drive around the Ozarks, you drive home night, notice there's very few ponds in the bottom because there's no clay to hold water. It's always on the ridge tops because those ridges are so eroded off or down to the clay area. So it's ridge top, but it's still in the hold water. But it's just the other day. And you may not have, oh, ponds are good because you got, oh, you got sunshine, right? Without sunshine, plants aren't growing. You can't go out on your favorite white oak tree that got a great big canopy and make a food plot because it's not going to get enough sun to grow. Those, White oak leaves are taking that moisture off, so or uh, sunlight off. So you can do this, uh, make you a food plot. You don't have to get rid of stumps, you're planting by hand. You know, you're not gonna drive your tractor and your no-till drill, but just fell some trees. We like combined resources, so there's a pond right there. We want as many attractants to the area as we can get. We don't want just one, we want four reasons for deer to walk right by there. So we make a little high deal food plot, and then you need to treat the stumps with a herbicide. Again, I'm not a herbicide, because if you don't, that tree, that tree's probably in the Ozarks, you know, grows real slow. That's 20, 30, 40 years old. All that energy in the roots is used to feeding that ton of wood that was on top there. It's coming out in stump sprouts with the vigor. So that's why you gotta use a herbicide. And the inside of stump, the inside of any hardwood tree, that's dead as a hammer. That's just structural support. So no need of wasting your herbicide on that. That's dead. Hey, how many of y'all had a windstorm here just the other day, lost some trees? How many people lost trees? Show me your hand. Did you notice how many of them were hollow? Yeah, I see head shaking. Because those are weak. Our forests are grossly mismanaged in the Ozarks. If you read these early explorers, they talk about riding a horse through the timber. Can, horse, can you ride a horse through most of your timber? Nah, it's too thick. That's because all the trees in the Ozarks have been harvested on our third growth. They got cut the first pass through, they got cut the second pass through to make railroad ties, and stump sprouts come up everywhere. This is not what Daniel Boone saw. But when you revert that to that savanna type habitat, you know, a tree ever 100 feet or 100 yards, and all the grasses and forbs in between, you will grow deer like Iowa. Because there's groceries everywhere. So anyway, do that. Treat that little edge right there, and then plant it right for rain. You can see this is the same little plot we're just working on. I tilt mine up, get a better arc that way. In turn, you don't have to tilt it up as much. He's not paying for the seed, see? <laughs> and then I like venison. It's not a per this is that same plot. All this it's not a perfect stand. But it's sure enough to attract deer when there's no acorns. They're coming in there. You see all the stumps? She's trying to pick us up. If we walked right through there getting to the stand. She's trying to pick us up. 
that's not a good shot. It's really tough to get both lungs. If you're a bow hunter, you want both lungs. You're probably getting one lung right there, and, and you may not recover the deer. So you want to wait. You don't want, it's close. I need close. I'm not a very good shot. She got a whiff of me right there. See it? Oh, back, just a whiff, just a whiff. Obviously, it's so cold that morning. Deer got to have water. Cameraman just said no. Cameraman. Sometimes you want to turn around and shoot the other way. Little buck, no. Uh oh. No, sorry, honey. You waited just a little bit too late. Watch that pocket. Oh, man, that was not going far. Matter of fact, that one went about 50 yards and tangled up right there. You always hear, you know. That did not take long at all. That'd be embarrassing. You always hear, you know, you got to shoot an 800 grain arrow or all this nonsense, folks. I don't know how many deer, but it's in the millions of deer were killed before the heavy arrow strategy come around. It's okay to think. Now, I like heavy arrows. If that fits your bow, heavy arrows will be a little quieter. I don't shoot at whitetails past 30 yards at all. I practice past 30 yards because whitetails move. They're not like elk who just stand there and look. Like, because Western animals, their escape mechanism is to spot the predator, the wolf, whatever. And as long as they keep the eye on it, they're okay. And then outrun it. Whitetails are in thicker habitat usually. They hear something, they sense something. What do they do? They drop in sprinter, sprinter position and get out of Dallas. They gotta load the glutes, so they literally get in sprinter position. Well, if their head is down, people used to say shoot when their head is down. If their head is down and they hear something, and you can always tell if deer are paying attention, you say, what head's down, they don't know Watch that ear, get your, eye. you can't tell the eyes because the eyes see such a radius. Watch the ear. And if it's cupping right towards you, that deer knows you're there. Even though it's not looking at you. Watch the ear. Ears are very articulate on a, on a deer, they can really move. If that ears are not pointed towards you, that deer doesn't know you're there. Watch the ears, that's the giveaway. But if that ear is just like right at you, you better have it close or that deer is gonna be gone for your arrow. Every, Arrows, you know, whatever, 250, 300 feet a second. Speed of sound is 1,100 feet a second. Give or take a little bit on barometric pressure. There is no comparison. So if they're in sprinter position and they hear that bow go off, the string slaps the cable. You cannot make a bow totally silent. On a recurve, it's slapping limbs. On a compound, the string is really slapping the cable, or the string slapping the cams. Native Americans shot longbows, right? They didn't have recurve. The string isn't slapping anything on a longbow. It's a D, the front of a D, and the string doesn't hit anything. Now you're limited, if you're coordinated like I am, you're not shooting too far, but it's the quietest bow you're gonna shoot. Quietest bow you're gonna shoot. Anyway, uh, when their head is down and their fanny's up, what I call sprinter position, and they hear something, well, when that head whips up, that's pushing the chest down, the vitals down. It's like a fulcrum, seesaw, if you're not an engineer. Teeter-totter, for you people looking at me like I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, and so that's why a lot of people shoot high, because the vitals actually dropped. I did that for years till we started videoing so much, and you go, man, that felt like a good shot. And you watch it frame by frame, you draw a little yellow circle, your arrow went right where you were aiming, just the deer moved. I'd say that's the most common mistake. Deer don't jump, by the way. People say jump string. They don't go up and the arrow goes under. If you miss under, you just made a bad shot. And deer can't drop any faster than gravity. They're not connected to the ground. They can't drop any faster than gravity. But when their head is down and they whip that big old heavy head and neck up, that can go faster than gravity because that's, again, that fulcrum or teeter-totter and they're pushing those vitals down. So just a little hint there. We like our hidey holes where we can approach hunting next without alerting deer. And deer get hunted a lot, right? So here's our wind direction. The magic this hidey hole is, I'll show you here in just a second. We're about 70 yards off a of bedding area. I want to be able to approach from the other side on a favorable wind 
and that buck have time to get to me before dark. A real magic to a hidey hole or any hunting situation in heavily pressured areas is you want that buck to be able to get you before it gets dark. If my food plot was way over there, there's no chance that deer, not much of a chance, that deer is going from this bedding area over there before dark, especially mature deer. So tuck in there close, build five or six of these things wherever you hunt, so no matter what the wind direction is, you got somewhere you can go. Did you create that bedding area? Oh yeah, that's chainsaw. That I lied. Someone I hired created that bedding area. Go ahead. Oh yeah, cedars. I mean, there's a few hardwood. You can sell cedars. It's, dry. it's since been burned and full of native grasses and forbs. Okay. Yeah, we just drop them. And the tree structure actually, again, just, just real world stuff here. You know, I, I don't make any living on hinge cutting order, but if you hinge cut or you drop these cedars, that can become a fawn trap for coyotes. That's a coyote food plot. Because the fawn can't get through there. A, a big mature deer may jump over. The fawn can't get through there. Coyotes go through it, under it, whatever. I don't have this slide in here. I wish I, I got it on my phone. I wish I had it on here. Uh, put it on my side, maybe we'll put it on the computer. But Daniel and I and another guy burned a bunch of cedar piles the other day where we actually did a different type of project. We piled them up. We'd rather just use it leave them like that and rip a fire through But we actually piled cedars. Been there for a long time, got dry. On one of those hot days there, they after rain, so it wasn't going to spread. The grass was not going to burn, but we could burn those piles really hot. We melted them and just pile of ash. First two I went to, once it cooled off, there were either a turkey or a fawn skeleton right in the center where bobcat or something had drug it back in under this real thick cedar pile. So that becomes a fawn trap. You gotta get through that stage. Then when you get grasses and forbs, if you think about real thick grasses, again, down at ground level, the wind's not going through there and that coyote's about gotta get on the critter, on the turkey nest or whatever before it can smell it. Because when it's really thick, that airflow's not moving much. A foot tall, three foot tall, the air's moving a lot more. So yeah, those have been burned. Yeah, this is another little hidey old food plot at my place. Daniel was filming this hunt, and I'm not real patient. How old's this deer? Quick, you gotta make a decision quick. How old's that deer? How old? Four and a half. Two and a half, four and a half, three and a half. How old was he, Daniel? I don't remember. Five. Five and a half. Stage of the rut makes a big difference. Stage of the rut. We knew that deer, I don't know if you noticed, there's a big scar on his back. So he was like the marked deer. I was almost cheating on that one. Yeah, a little high, these high deal food plots, again, deer are gonna keep a mate pretty low, so they become an instant strut area in the spring. You're in a big, thick forest, and now all of a sudden, you got an opening, where's those gobblers going? I mean, like clockwork. This is probably not a fly down plot, it's not that big. This is a 9.30 on plot. If you call like I do, you can just sit there. Those old toms, follow them around. Hidey hose are just one tool. Let's go through some other stuff, but hidey hose are just one tool. We cut a lot of cedars. Again, I mean, it's hard maybe for some people to understand how many cedars we cut. Early explorers that went through here, don't mention cedars. They're very rare. What you see going down 44 or 65 is a byproduct of bad management for years. How's this deer? You know that because I'm not drawing my bow? That was tempting. But if you fall, it was three and a half, exactly. You're right. You don't grow four year old motor bucks. That, my friends, on top of a burn we just did this summer for habitat. It's like the total picture. So I'm going to back up. Now look at this better when you look at it. Don't worry about the buck this time. Those are all cedars. You can see the carcasses are where we burn. Good groceries are coming up. There's just enough cover for that buck to feel perfectly comfortable. We're on the, this is a morning hunt. And we're on the, look, and you see the stain licked off. Didn't go all the way down his leg on the tarsals there. We're on the very bottom of this hillside where we cut all cedars. Because in the morning until 9.30 or 10, cold air think, sinks and the thermals are coming down. We went up the creek, up 60 yards to the edge of that cut right there and see the boundary of the cut and let the thermals come down. Once we feel those thermals going up, that hunt's over. 
We got no chance of deer getting in bow range. You're almost no chance. We just did this so yeah, we there. made that area and that dope. edge, that edge is going to be that travel corridor for bucks. I saw him out in there. I hit that grunt call. An ideal grunt call isn't that big tuba buck, you know, the big ad on there just sound like the big buck in the woods. That's going to scare most bucks away. I want to see deer. My ideal grunt call sounds like a two and a half year old buck. It's high pitched, but a lot of high pitched calls to make them high pitched, the reed goes too fast. And the deer hear that and they go, well, I never heard that bird before. I don't know what that bird was. It's got to be high pitched, but the normal cadence of a deer. It can't be. So you just, I don't know the brand, but look for that. This is my daughter, Raleigh. Uh, she killed that deer, I think, two years later. And if you notice, it grew an extra big drop time. This drop time got a lot longer and a lot more mass. The mat, a deer's eye is about four inches. Look at the base of that antler. If you're a bow hunter, you can kind of use the base of the antler as a pretty good indicator. Not an exact indicator, but a good indicator of a buck's age. If it's smaller than a diameter die, probably a pretty young buck. About the same size as the eye, kind of a medium buck. Much bigger than the eyeball, shoot. Here's another scenario. This is more of a rifle hunting scenario. You can certainly use firearms in, a, in Idaho. You know, this is one of those really small genetic Ozark deer. Got those bad genetics down here in the Ozarks. Yeah. He's, br he's busted up his ankle there, chasing. Probably got in a fight at prom. Yeah. That wasn't good. There it is. Nothing on a power line. Power line's off to the Ozarks because Tay brought yeah. little shows. Lots of power lines through here. There we go, right Gotta there. get that angle where to fall over. I don't like chasing deer. I don't know about y'all. I, li I like to know where they go. Bingo! And that's this particular shot placement. And I want Super a bullet buck. that really expands. This is 243. Y'all thought you had to have, you know, a 300 wind mag or something to do that. I, I don't, I'm not a big guy. I don't like being stomped. And, and I'm long past having an ego because I've been married for decades. That's, that's totally gone out of me, so. You want a bullet like, like this, Deer season XP, it's built to expand. Whitetails are thin skinned. We're not hunting grizzly bears. Whitetails are very thin skinned. And you want a bullet that really expands. So, Daniel and I and our whole team have been using deer season XP since they came out. During the rut, bucks typically lose 30% of their body weight, and that was in the pens where I went to school, research pens. All the feed they could eat. They eat some, more falls out of the trough. They eat some in an acre or half acre pen, three bucks, three does, no coyotes, no hunters, no dodge pickups. They're living the life. Still lose 30% of their body weight during the rut in a half acre, acre pen. You think about the cost of reproduction out in the wild. So by the time I harvest this deer, late gun season, when I got ready, I was not going to drag him up the mountain by myself, but came in and said, drag him a little bit. And I oh, boy, it's going to be tough. So it's going to be embarrassing. So, I really, I didn't think I could move the deer actually because I was thinking about these summer pictures. I got all braced up and well, I hope I can get three steps out of this, you know, and got my gun in one hand and grab an antler. Thing. Oh Lord, let me slide. It's uphill too. Thing. I'm not going to budge him. I about fell down because I think he's going to weigh, you know, 220, 250, 150 pounds. That's the cost of, of stress or cost of the rut on males, not on females. Females are rutting for two and a half, three days or less. Bucks are going for a long time. If you have an out of balance sex ratio, you got too many does and not enough bucks, that number, that percent loss is going way down. Fawns come out 50 50. 48 52 is pretty, ske is pretty skewed. I'm talking fawn ratio, fawn sex ratio. We need to harvest 50 50. Most people aren't even close to that. We harvest about five to one because our neighbors don't harvest enough does. So we, we try to harvest about five does for every buck. Been doing it for 20 plus years, haven't ran out of deer yet. Felon cedars. I talk about this here because hometown crowd. I mean, the Ozarks are cover cedars. These areas used to be glades. You may have been to Branson, you may have heard of the show The Bald Knobbers. Anyone ever heard of The Bald Knobbers? Anyone know what The Bald Knobbers really were? I mean, you got to read more, folks. Bald Knobbers were vigilantes in the Ozarks during the Civil War. And they met on bald, they were called that because they met on balds. 
South, southwest facing slopes, there were no trees, bald, no trees. That's where the word balds or bald knobbers come from. Now we call them cedar glades. And then time passed, that's where all the grasses and forbs were. There were no cedars there because of all the fire. Fire kills little cedars. Okay? Time passed, people said, I'm putting my cows on these bulbs. That's where the grass is. The north slopes were timbered, south slopes were bulbs, basically. They put cows on there. Cows ate grass and forbs, don't eat cedars. Cedars had an unfair advantage. And through a pretty short period of time, we got cedars everywhere. And the habitat quality went way right down. It used to be woodland bison all through the Ozarks. Elk all through the Ozarks. You couldn't sport elk. Arkansas stocked elk 30 years ago. I think they now draw for five tags a year or something like that because they got them in a closed campy forest on the Buffalo River. That's not elk habitat. Elk are grass eaters. It takes sunshine on the ground to grow grass. All right, so here's a place where we failed all the cedars. You can see them laying on the ground. And then look right over here where we didn't. There's no groceries in here. Look here. After These were just failed or green. Let them dry for two years, drop a match, and hatch some good habitat. This is way before. We, we kill cedars. As many as our budget will allow a year. We're about out of cedars, which is okay with me. So here's an example, and before I get going here, so we've got a food plot up here. There was enough hard, some cedars, but a lot of hardwoods here. And then we go to a true cedar glade, south-facing slope. Very few hardwoods. There's one to get you in scale, if you train in your eyes. Cedar skeletons. Fair amount of native grasses. Cut every cedar on that slope. Burned it made really good habitat. So now I got bedding area, all kind of food, some acorns and a food plot. It's about 400 feet elevation change. That's a fire. From that food plot to the creek bottom is about 400 foot elevation change. Pretty steep. Hatch some good, we use a back and fire until we get past the hardwoods we don't want to kill. Then we go to bottom, set head fire and let it rock. Fire burns uphill about 16 times faster than it will back downhill because uphill it's preheating the fuel. Heat rises. It'll get rocking uphill. If you don't know what you're doing, always start with that backing fire, backing into the wind or down the slope. Don't set a head fire the first time. You probably get a little nervous. All right, burnt that slope. There's some hardwood saplings coming back. Here's a little buck in the Ozarks, one of those genetically deprived deer. Uh, got groceries out there all summer, right? That's green in summer. They're eating 80 plants, all kind of good stuff out there. We've identified 176 different species, us in the state, of grass and forbs on our property through the years, not all at once. That's rainforest diversity. There's some for deer to eat every day. I'm on the other slope, by the way. That, that bullet tossed out there a little bit. Pretty good sized deer, hunting with the 308, deer season XP. Y'all thought I missed, dude. No, he's going down. Is he down? He's down. He's down. Pretty good little deer, 172 and he's down. inches. Not bad, Neil Zark. Oh, my goodness. 287. Love these blinds because they hold a lot more scent in. Now, I got the windows open for shooting and filming. You leave those windows shut, you can get away with a lot. Here's the real data from our place. These are just our trail cameras, right? This is real from our place. We're just down here 10 miles north of Branson. So, first month. Uh, I, I call October first month. I'm old. I remember deer season you start first of October. And uh, this is our real data. And deer are crepuscular, pretty much daylight and dark, dusk and dark. Daylight and dark. Any idea why deer move? Almost always daylight and dark. There'll be a few deer move midday, coyote jump them, you know, neighbor's dog, whatever. Huh? That's a good thought, but not. Not. I've jumped deer in the middle of the night, too, you know, going in the blind. I get to hear one go, oh, I hit that tree on the way out here. They see just fine. They have tatum lucidium, basically aluminum foil on the back of their eyeballs, and they have a much bigger people. So light comes in, triggers rods and cones, hit that reflective area, and goes back out. Y'all in the Ozarks know that because you got your spotlight out there looking at it. Yeah, I know what you're doing. Yeah. So when the light goes out, it triggers rods and cones again. So they get more light and almost twice use out. A little inefficiency that some absorbs, but they get way more light. Coons, anything that walleye, anything that light shines back has that tatum lucidium cover on the back drive. So not that. They can see it night or day, no problem. Just squinch their eyes down when it's bright. I'll keep going here. Here's, here's November. Uh-oh, not as many pictures. Did we move our cameras to the wrong place? Still daylight. This is the rut. I'm going to hunt all day. And you might see a deer. 
Some people certainly kill a deer at noon, but your odds are against you. And if you stay in the same stand all day long, you're respirating. You're breathing. You're putting bacteria out there that smells like a predator. I don't care. I mean, buy all the spray you can, folks. Please buy it. Good for tax base. But you can't cover your respiration. You're breathing. That's the big no-no. Not your urine, but this. How about December? A little bit fewer deer, still crepuscular. So what happens at daylight and dark? I don't know if I got that, there they all are together. What's happening as a hunter at daylight and dark? Thermals are changing. Yes. You're like one of the only people that's ever got that. Thermals are changing. The wind is swirling. They get protection from predators almost 360. At daylight, at dark, at nighttime, the thermals are just rushing downhill. When the sun starts coming up and warming up a few surfaces, some of it's going up, some's going down, and the shade is still going down, out in the sun, it's still going up, and it's just churning. And they can detect a predator a big area. At nighttime, Air's only going one way unless there's a storm or something weird going on, weather speaking. Same thing in the afternoon, e late evening. Start getting shadow, shade, some air's cooling off. You feel it, you go, oh, I think deer are going to move now. You've been there. All of a sudden you start feeling it cooler. And you've said this, about time for deer to move. Because they're moving because they got more protection from the nose. White oaks are a huge factor because they have less acid in them than red oaks, so deer eat white oaks first. They're not as bitter, they don't have as much tannic acid. Anyone seen a lot of acorns this year where you hunt? Anyone? You are? Almost none on our property. This year's a great year to scout because that windstorm, all the trees down, you don't have to use your binoculars, just walk around and look at the top of the trees. They're laying on the ground. Not many acorns are our place. Food plots are gonna be red rocket hot this year. I'll make that prediction feel strong because there's not gonna be a lot of acorns. On a year there's a lot of acorns, you go, man, I don't know what I planted. Deer don't like it. Whatever you plant, it's probably fine. They're just, they'd rather eat acorns. They're programmed, acorns are real high in carbohydrates, and deer are genetically programmed to store fat. I'm not genetically programmed to store fat year round, I think. But in the fall, deer are genetically programmed to put fat on to make it through the winter and the rut. Remember, they're going to lose 30% of their body weight, bucks are during the rut. They're going to beef up ahead of time. So white oaks hit the ground in the Ozarks, you know, about mid-October, somewhere near, a lot of variables each year, kind of that range. Not many this year. If you don't know, white oaks don't have these little hair. Any tree that has this little hair is in the red oak family. We say red oak, but there's a hundred and some odd species in the red oak family. This is the typical, stereotypical red oak pattern. This is the typical white oak, but post oaks are also white oaks. Burr oaks are also white oaks. A lot of white oaks. This is the... Well, the true white oak. All members of the white oak family have less acid in the acorn. Acid's bitter tasting than red oaks. I believe God made it that way. White oaks, after you got white oaks on the ground, you get a big old warm rain in October, what happens? They sprout. You see that little root coming out the back end. As soon as that sprout comes out, the chemistry changes. Deer aren't touching them. So... White oaks are the early food, but in case it rains and there's no, you know, got something to eat in November, December, I think God put red oaks out there because they got that acid that's a preservative, and they may stay good to March. I've killed turkeys full of red oak acorns. When you both of them, you've got a longer food source. There's always a plan, and you can't beat the plan. Can't do it better. Like I said, we have a bunch of trees coming down our place. Almost all of them are hollow, coon dens. Not sad to see those coon dens go. Not many acorns. Not many at all. I am seeing some persimmons. I don't get all gooey-eyed or persimmons like a lot of people do. This year, they'd probably be a pretty big attraction because there's not a lot of acorns out there if you've got a persimmon grove. Persimmons are monoecious. Anyone know what that means? I didn't know when I went to college either, folks. Don't worry about it. Monoecious means each tree is a boy or a girl. So you may see persimmons that never make persimmons. That's just a female. Still got to have them for the pollen. But persimmons are male and female. You won't know in any given year. It could have been a drought or that tree got stressed. So before you cut that male tree down, 
watch it two or three years. And you got to have males too so they can contribute to the process. So in general, you know, habitat improvement should focus on adding what is least available. If you're in the middle of a big old timber stand, well, heck, that may be a high hill food plot. They're coming to it until the acorns hit the ground, and then again after acorns hit the ground. Kind of think of acorns as a way for your food plots to grow for a month or two, because deer aren't eating on them as much. Maybe it's water, and you're making a little pond or stock tank or something, kiddie pool. Maybe you have no visibility, so you're mowing or weed eating the power line so you can reach out there and you know, get 300 yards out of your gun instead of 50 yards. Figure out what's limited in your area. If you're not worried about growing bigger deer, then you need something on your property that attracts deer more than the neighbor's property during gun season. Neighbor got a big soybean field. Probably not, if they harvest those beans, probably not doing them a lot of good during gun season. So you don't need to plant food plots, you need some winter plots. You don't need summer plots, you need winter plots. Or, you know, you, you need to think about where do I want a deer to stand that I can also be there without alerting deer? And what does that need be? And we have food, cover, and water to do it. Man, I'm next to Mark Twain. It's a closed canopy forest. I need some bedding. I'd rather have bedding than all three. Why would I rather have bedding? Yeah, deer use it during daytime when I'm hunting. They can feed at night. I like bedding. Because that's I'm, I'm out there when they're out there. But use whatever you need. If you have acorn trees everywhere, you're not going to do much good planting the latest, greatest chestnut variety out there. Guy can only eat so many Snickers bars. You don't need to add more what you got plenty of. If there's stock ponds all over the property, making that little Heidi Hill water pond as you saw on YouTube on the ridgetop may or may not help you. If you're in West Texas, water's definitely a great thing to add to your property. So think it through. If you want to grow deer, you have to have food during the growing season. If you want bigger antlers, you have to have food during the growing season. Corn does never grow an antler. You see big antlers in corn country because why do they grow in corn country? Beans. Beans are protein. Alpha, alpha, beans, whatever. Yeah. Corn is carbohydrates. It's never grown an antler. Can't grow an antler. It's just corn is mainly carbs. You want to lose weight, why do you try to cut out your diet? Carbs. Sugar. You want to build more muscle mass, what do you eat a lot of? Protein. Antlers are about 90% protein when they're forming. 90%. So, you know those really low, poor quality genetic Ozark deer? Well, they're really starved for protein. Put them up in northern Missouri where they're eating beans all the time, all of a sudden those genetics change, right? No, the genetics didn't change. They got better groceries. So if you got closed camp before us, you don't have much protein. If you kill a bunch of trees and put some fire out there, and all of a sudden you got all these native legumes growing, a lot of native legumes, uh, you grow bigger deer per age class. If you want bigger deer, you also have to let them get older. The biggest, biggest, biggest determinant of antler size is age. So first you got to let them get older, then you got to give them groceries, and if you want really big deer, you need about three generations, just like I talked about at Mississippi State, because if we, heaven forbid, um, you're, a child is from a mom that was addicted to drugs or couldn't eat or third world country or something, and then you bring that child into the perfect environment, best food, best care, whatever. Child's won life's lottery, that's awesome. But it will never express its full genetic potential because it had a poor time in prenatal health. That's why you see all these ads for humans about prenatal health. It's everything to the life of that child, not just the first few months, the life of that child. So if our place in the Ozarks with what I call German Shepherd dog-sized deer, we didn't turn that around the first year or two. You need those fawns to have good nutrition, get big, and still on good habitat, and let their fawns have fawns and then let their fawns have fawns. I don't think we've reached the top yet. I think we still got room to grow bigger deer. Our habitat keeps getting bigger. Uh, we keep reducing stress. Uh, and I, I don't think we've hit the top of our deer herd's potential yet.